Okay, we are now recording. Great, thank you, Stephanie. And hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. Um, this is the um, Friday, February 3rd, 2023 meeting of the Solar Bylaw Working Group in Amherst. And uh, thank everybody for, for being here and also for starting at 11 o'clock today uh, as a as a one, once, one only uh, one off. Uh, and we'll uh, plan to end it at one by one o'clock. Uh, but we'll revert back to our 1130 normal meeting time um, in subsequent meetings. Um, to get started, um, my notes have that Dan is the minute taker today. Does that work for you, Dan? Yeah, great. Thank you. Appreciate that. And thank you to, um, uh, is Laura here? I don't I'm see here. Oh yeah, there you are. Okay, great. Thank you, Laura, for the uh, minutes last meeting. Um, let me, before we get going, let me just ask Stephanie if we want to um, uh, just rearrange the agenda to have Erin go first as she's here um, before we do the other uh, activities. Sure. And Adrian is going to be joining us as well. So I think when she shows up, we might want to move that agenda item as well. But sure, Aaron is here and you could start now and move the other items further back. Sure. Um, uh, if there's no objection, I, I'd like to do that just to um, uh, accommodate Aaron's time and Adrian when, if and when she gets here and we're ready. Uh, that would be great. Um, but let me, um, um, who are we missing anybody? Uh, just so I sort of have that straight from the group. No, I think we have everybody. Well, Chris hasn't joined yet. Well, Chris, yeah, Chris, exactly. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. Okay. Um, all right, great. Um, I guess before we go into Aaron, um, uh, and maybe I'll have you, Stephanie, introduce Aaron uh, just to the group. Um, bef but when we when we get to that, I just want to, if, if you don't mind, I just wouldn't mind uh just setting the stage in terms of our um where we stand in our schedule uh and our um uh, uh looming now somewhat looming deadline uh for the um for the uh bylaw that we are um responsible for providing as a recommendation to the town by the end of may um, and if I can just quickly share my screen, I, I promise Aaron this won't take long. I just wanted to get everybody sort of uh, grounded on on uh, on our timing and and um, interest today to talk a little bit about um, accelerating our pace on the um, actual writing of the bylaw. Um, let me just quickly uh, share that portion of my screen. Uh, so if you recall, you know this was not. Uh, a perfect or or uh, uh, um, ground into stone sort of uh, time frame, but this was a guide uh, for us uh, to basically finish up the bylaw by the end of May. Uh, we still are on that schedule and need to um, uh, have a bylaw done, a draft bylaw done uh, to move forward to the town by the end of May. In my context, that kind of means at the end of this now now new semester, um, and so um, that kind of puts it in perspective. Here here we are in February, um, and um, we are um, in the process. Uh, we have started with some language uh, with uh, that Chris has brought forward to us, and we've had some chance to review and move forward on that. Um, we do have have had had some opportunity to talk about some of the issues that are. Uh, confronting us uh, in terms of water supply, uh, battery storage, and issues with regard to safety uh, associated with battery storage. We'll hear about wetlands today. Um, I do want to, uh, we, we, we've had opportunity to review and, and um, talk about the uh, solar assessment and the in, uh, uh, community survey and engagement. Um, I want to kind of think about putting those things behind us and moving forward in earnest uh, on the bylaw writing and the deliberations amongst ourselves that go into that. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the agenda today, um, but um, I just wanted to bring this up again as kind of a grounding uh, for where we're at and where we need to go. Um, I don't think we're um, 
behind, uh, but we need to move in earnest here um, as we move forward with this uh, uh, bylaw uh, drafting. Um, Chris is not here yet, I don't think, uh, but obviously we're also um, in a situation where um, uh, the, the planning department is, is uh, um, has had some resource issues. Um, and so um, we, we're, we're um, subject to the uh, availability and, and uh, um, opportunity for Chris to really help uh, lead the, the, the drafting of this. Uh, but I think um, that should, we, we, we should all be prepared to um, move forward uh, with her, um, with her lead on the drafting uh, to move this forward over the next uh, couple months. Uh, so any thoughts on that before we um, get into the agenda? Great. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's um, move to the agenda topic on the um, uh, discussion of the uh, Amherst Wetlands, uh, discussion with the Amherst Wetlands administra Administrator, Aaron uh, Jacques. Uh, so, Stephanie, do you want to just introduce her I, I, um, uh, as, as sort of her role in the town? Sure. Thank you, Duane. Um, I would just like to say that Amherst is extremely fortunate to have Erin Jacques as our wetlands administrator. She comes with um, a lot of years of experience with uh, multiple municipalities um, and is just an incredible GIS expert on top of everything else that she's good at. One of the most amazing analysts um, that I know. So I'm really thankful to be working with her as a colleague and really happy to have her um, have an opportunity to speak with you all today. So Erin, it's all yours. I'm gonna wipe away the tears, Stephanie. You're making me cry over here, my goodness. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm not, uh, I feel a little, a little, you know, nervous sort of how, you know, how I can help you guys today, but just to sort of generally introduce what I do um, anytime a permit comes through the town where there's um, a development that's proposed in a jurisdictional wetland resource area or buffer zone, um, I would be reviewing those permits, commenting on them and sort of guiding the commission being sort of the liaison with the commission in terms of helping them to dissect the regulations and how to help a project to comply with the regulations, um, making sure that sensitive resource areas are protected um, during, you know, from start to finish on a construction site, um, anywhere from attending pre-construction meetings to monitoring construction to sort of closing out and making sure that projects were constructed in compliance with the permit. Um, I also do um, sort of half of my job is also open space management. So, you know, assisting with permitting on conservation lands and making sure that the town is following the same rules that the public is um, for any projects that come on town conservation lands. Um, I think that that's sort of just a general introduction, but um, just to make sure that it's clear, we have the State Wetland Protection Act, and we also have our local wetland protection bylaw and regulations. So those are the specific regulations that I help um, the Conservation Commission with. Great. I think we can um, turn it maybe more into a, a Q and A uh, with Aaron, if you're if you're so willing, um, and uh, and try to sort of talk a little bit about. Um, maybe the intersection, and 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 Chris, you, you can be helpful here too. I, I I suspect of sort of this intersection between what what goes into a zoning bylaw, uh, and what uh, in terms of of um, uh, you know for the case of solar, uh, how do we think about a zoning a zoning bylaw in in ways that would be protective of of wetlands and so forth? What's sort of covered in in a zoning bylaw versus what we sort of don't have to worry about because it's really covered in the wetland wetland review process. You want me Sorry. to talk about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe if you start, Chris, and then and then uh, maybe you and, and Aaron can sort of uh, help us sort of parse that out. So whenever anything comes to the planning board or the zoning board of appeals, we send out a transmittal to um, all the people on the town staff like the fire department and the town engineer and um, Aaron as the wetlands administrator and others 
to make sure that they know about the project. And then um, as the project moves forward, we seek uh, if it's possible to get some written comments from those individuals and um, make sure that we um, speak with them if they have any concerns about a project. Mm -hmm. So in the case of Aaron, if a project has wetlands on it, or if the project is within 100 feet of a wetlands, um, of a delineated wetland, or if it's within 200 feet of a, um, a perennial stream, um, Aaron would certainly be involved and the Conservation Commission would be involved in the project. And so she would um, do an analysis of the project to see how it uh, did or did not have an impact on wetland resource areas. Um, and then uh, it, such a project with which did have um, which the conservation did have jurisdiction over would go through a public hearing process with the conservation commission with Aaron um, giving them advice and recommendations about how to look at the project and then um, that information would go into the conservation commission's uh, decision about whether the project could move forward or not or whether it needed to be changed in order to move forward and so both the planning board and the zoning board of appeals um, if a project is subject to wetlands uh, review, um, would not make any decisions about such a project until they had heard from the Conservation Commission. Um, so uh, yeah, so we would work very closely with Aaron on that. Um, I think that's what I have to say about uh, our interaction on on wetlands. But um, you know, it's more it's kind of like an iterative conversation. It's um, you know, we would go to her to get her take on it, and then we would, um, as as the project moved forward, keep having conversations about it. It's not just a one a one shot thing. Um, so, and the project would thereby be reshaped in order to be able to be approved by the Conservation Commission. So, I think that's all I have to say right now. Great. And would this cover um, both in terms of the ultimate um, design and layout and operation of the project, as well as what, what in the case of solar, for example, the construction uh, a period of the project as well, in terms of how that's um, designed and, and, and planned out in terms of the protection of the, of the wetlands? You want Aaron or me to answer? Yeah, uh, uh, either, either one, whoever is, feels comfortable answering that. Well, Erin yeah. has a, an ongoing process with the Conservation Commission, so she could probably talk about that, and then I can talk about anything anything subsequent to that. Yes, so to answer your question, yes, we, um, so there could be two permits. There could be a permit from the Zoning Board and a permit from the Conservation Commission simultaneously, and um, there may be a given site that's governed by two separate permitting um, entities, but they're both monitored by both of those parties. In some cases, there may be a permit that's just CONCOM and zoning and planning aren't included and or there might be a permit that's just zoning or planning and CONCOM isn't related if there's no wetland resource areas. But there are many cases where um, there's sites that the project is governed by both bodies. So just in addition to that, may I say something? Please, that, yes. Erin um, is going out to the site. She's um, making sure that the wetlands are flagged appropriately, and that has to be approved by the Conservation Commission. Then once construction starts, either Erin is out there observing the con uh, construction, or the um, Conservation Commission has hired a third party to um, review and monitor. Um, or it could also require that the applicant uh, pay money for the town to hire an outside party to review the project as it moves ahead. So there is a lot of um, observation that goes on during construction. Great. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I see Janet, and then we'll go with Martha. So, um, I, I'm the one who suggested that Erin come here and talk to us because of her comments on the, um, I always get this wrong, the um, the um, plan done by the Drinking Water um, Protection Committee. And she had um, cited a bunch of effects and impacts on forests and soils and groundwater. And um, 
I thought that was, you know, they were very detailed comments. So I thought it'd be useful if she could come here and sort of explain her comments and what she thinks the potential impacts of um, large scale solar arrays are in forests over drinking water supplies and just, you know, impacts on soils. And then maybe what suggestions she has in terms of things that we could put into our solar bylaw to make sure, you know, like that these impacts are minimized or prevented. So, so I actually, it's her comments that I'm sort of most interested in were started on page eight of the, um, the comments to the Amherst Water Supply Protection Committee's white paper. So, is this what we, is this the, I just have a quick question, Dwayne, is this, do we have time to go through all this? Was this what was the, the agenda for Aaron was for? Isn't that, I think that was the whole purpose, really. Isn't, I just want to make sure. Yeah, go ahead, Stephanie. Did you have a comment oh, on that? Just to say that I don't think that was the whole purpose. I think Aaron, because we've been bringing in um, expertise, I think it was to understand the potential impacts of solar on, in the wetland regulation process. So what I would have suggested is that maybe Aaron just sort of go through, if you get a solar project that's submitted to the town, what is Aaron's process of review? So yeah. Yeah, not just, specific to the water supply protection committee paper. Yeah, just, just one sitting on the conservation committee and Aaron does fantastic work. You know, the conservation committee and Aaron's work is really just to uphold the wetlands protection act so that the paper you're citing Martha is beyond that. Um, the wetlands protection act is very clear in terms of what the concom and Aaron is responsible for. So uh, I, that's up to you, Dwayne, but um, it's it's a bit, it's different, right? That the paper is not part of the Conservation Commission. Yeah, I think if, if we can start with a, a, just any um, sort of thoughts, Aaron, from you with regard to, uh, you know, if and when, for example, uh, some of the solar projects we have had, ground-mounted solar projects in Amherst, um, what was sort of the, the um, issues you looked at in terms of uh and what your review kind of showed uh of those projects with regard to um the impacts and mitigation of those impacts on on wetlands um uh some of these projects have been enforced some some have been on the landfill or or, or uh i'm thinking of hickory ridge as well yeah so it's a lot to unpack sort of all the all the questions and um, I've been trying to take notes. So I think there's a lot of dependent factors, right? And particularly with any development, there's a lot of dependent factors. Like for example, what is the existing ground cover? What is the existing slope? What is the proximity to wetlands? Um, and all those factors sort of come into play when you're reviewing a permit. Um, I mean, I think with any project, there's potential for impacts to surface and groundwater. Um, and so generally sort of what my review process is, is to make sure that the surface and groundwater is protected in the course of the project. And also that we're preventing erosion and sediment from getting from, um, from the site into adjacent wetland resource areas. Um, the other large sort of component of my job is reviewing stormwater. Um, so when a permit comes through, there's generally like a large um, stormwater management plan that's associated with the project. And so I'm looking at every proposed stormwater best management practice and looking at the treatment train that's associated with that um, stormwater management plan to make sure that um, all areas of the site are being um, water is being adequately intercepted, treated, and discharged in a manner that's not going to be causing um, damage to resource areas. Um, also looking at the BMPs specifically to make sure that they're designed in accordance with the BMP, with this D, uh, DEP best, best management practice manual. So a lot of times like, and this is just a general comment, like you might get a permit where a stormwater BMP isn't designed in compliance with a DEP handbook. And I'll have to say to folks, oh, you've got to um, adjust this design because it's really not in accordance with the way that these structures are supposed to be designed. So that's just another example. Um, so, I mean, in terms of like any, and I'll just talk generally any project, but um, like if a site is like on a flat grassed area, 
versus a sloped um, forested area, the impacts are going to be different, right? And so we have to really um, make sure that whatever is being proposed is taking into consideration the topography, the vegetation. And one of the things I look at really closely is the sequence of construction. Um, so for example, um, well, a sequence of construction and also phasing, those are two like very, very paramount um, issues on large sites. So for example, um, I would around this, the different sections of phasing, um, there would be independent erosion controls around each phase, for example. There might be independent um, temporary stormwater management controls around each phase. And then as each phase is developed and stabilized, then um, uh, they move on to the next phase. And, and then once all phases are constructed and all phases are stabilized, then the permanent stormwater management system um, comes online. Um, at that point, the temporary measures are no longer necessary. The site is stable and it can sort of function as it's supposed to in the long term. Um, as Chris alluded to, you know, in the course of construction, we have um, monitors who are out on site. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is an extremely important part of the whole process is that folks are on the ground watching what's happening um, to make sure if there's erosion building up behind controls or if there's um, rills and gullies forming on a hillside that we're um, putting down erosion control blankets that the erosion is being cleaned up from behind controls. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, if there's helpful. more, I, I try to be holistic in my answers, but if there's more specificity you want, I'm happy to, you know, go in any direction. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, Martha. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was very helpful for me. I, I think my questions are relevant to the section of the bylaw that we're going to be reviewing to today. Uh, it sounds like much of what you just described is like what we were thinking of after, you know, based on some what some of Jack's comments and how to monitor the construction site. And I think we were putting in uh, a sentence in the bylaw that would say that during construction, there should be a, a weekly monitoring. Now, does that first, does that seem consistent with what you would think? And um, it sounds like that's the kind of thing you would do, but would you do it only if there's already defined wetlands on that property, or would that be your role as part of stormwater management? Or, um... yeah, you know, you, that's a really excellent question, uh, Martha. So, and um, I think it's a kind of a complicated answer. So, on any construction site, the people who are working on the site should be trained. Right, because they're on the ground 24 hours a day or, you know, <laughs> during their work schedule, right, whatever that work schedule is from dawn till dusk or whatever, and maybe into the night, who knows, um, but those folks should be trained. So there should be sort of environmental training for people who are doing the work themselves. Then there's a secondary level, which is folks who come and they're doing sort of periodic inspection, sort of spot check, so to speak. And in our conservation commission orders of conditions, generally those um, inspections are done once a week. And then we get a report once a month. Um, however, if there's a rainfall over a certain amount, for example, um, in some cases like an inch and a half of rain, anything over that amount, there would have to be an inspection too. So, um, because really rain is what's dictating um, a lot of the uh, site stability issues. Mm -hmm. Yes, and in the section of the bylaw for today, there was something about, you know, inspections after quote, large storms and question, what's the definition of a large storm? So is that your definition more than an inch and a half of rain in a certain time period? Or what would you um, a recommendation of what ought to be in the bylaw? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I now I'm now this is sort of an on the spot question, and so I'd really love to like be able to get back to Stephanie on that, just because I want to look at our um, standard boilerplate conditions and see what that calls out. I, in some cases, um, like 
it, it could be anything over an inch, anything over an inch and a half, anything over two inches, but you know, um, so there's a couple pieces to that. So, so yes, it's good to sort of nail down what that should be. Um, but also I think it's really important that to understand that the people who are working on the site should also be monitoring the site. And that, so for example, somebody comes out and does an inspection once a week, but let's say um, their site conditions throughout the week and something happens, the people who are on site should also be able to recognize, oh, we have a problem here, we need to address this um, and kind of keep everybody in the loop about what's going on at the same time. Um, sometimes there's like, erosion control inspections happening and also SWIP inspections. So that's like a separate um, specific inspection that's done. Um, so sometimes there's multiple sort of uh, layers of inspecting that's going on at the same time. And do you think that there should be any on the on a maximum slope then for a project that's going to be, you know, sort of, I don't know, disturbing an area and then constructing and so on? or do you think there's enough safeguards that can be written in or how do you uh... do, do I think there should be a maximum slope with regard to like if something is is greater than a certain percentage of slope then it shouldn't be allowed to be developed is that what you're getting at yeah yeah whether there's any limits or or do you do you focus uh... requirements of of how it should be handled or or, or something or yeah um so with um, with other commissions I've worked for, they have had limitations on um, slopes, and in some cases, like slope can dictate extending jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. Um, it it depends on so many things. Like, is it within Conservation Commission jurisdiction for one? Um, and and then two, if it is in Conservation Commission jurisdiction, looking at the extent of the slope, what it's comprised of, you know, what we can do to sort of minimize the impacts, because there there are ways to stabilize slopes. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot of dependent factors there, but um, I can't say like, oh, over a certain percentage of slope shouldn't be developed. Um, it's more so just uh, looking at every site individually and determining, you know, the overall sort of context of the project. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Helps me understand things. Thank you. Yep, Stephanie. Thank you, Duane. I just wanted to add a little bit to what Aaron was saying that, first of all, the stormwater management is not solely the purview of the Conservation Commission. So they're one of the bodies that review it, but it's not just on the on the Conservation Commission to oversee that. Also, as Aaron said, each site is specific. So um, when you're asking about a certain uh, rainstorm event, it may be that depending on the topography of the specific project site, you may have a different requirement for when you which rain events you want to go out and inspect the site, depending on the specifics of the conditions of that of that project site. So um, I think it makes it a little challenging to sort of have a blanket after X storm event, we will check every site, may not be relevant and consistent with each site. So I think you just wanna have, you know, that might be something that the Conservation Commission might be um, more inclined to sort of oversee or dictate than the the bylaw might say specifically, if that, if that makes sense. Great, okay. Um... All right, Janet. So um, anyway, I, I am interested in like your thoughts um, on the impacts of large scale solar arrays in forests and on, you know, obviously the forests also have wetlands. And so I checked my notes. I think I actually was the note taker for that meeting. And so that was, you know, one thing that Jack had said was that your comments had gone beyond like the purview of the white paper. And so I, I'm hoping that you could say, talk a little bit, talk about like what you think the impacts are on forests, their soils, um, transpiration, all those things like that. And so, um, and your concerns about that, because I know, you know, large scale solar, you know, is anywhere from, you know, an acre of panels to, you know, 49 or 50 acres of panels or stuff. And so, so I just really am looking for you to sort of elaborate and explain your comments to the, on the white paper on that. Um, and I think I'm the person who had asked that that you come in and talk about that. 
And I'm hoping that we'll do that. Yeah, I mean, so to be totally honest, I feel like my comments on the white paper kind of speak for themselves. Um, but I think generally speaking, any project that comes before the Conservation Commission, I review thoroughly. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not going to talk about any project in particular um, or single out any project in particular. Um, but some of the things that I might be looking for is sort of the extent of clearing and proximity to a resource area. So, for example, if they were clear cutting within 10 feet of a bordering vegetated wetland or a vernal pool, then I might um, raise concerns about, um, you know, the impacts of um, heat and sunlight interfering with the function of the wetland and, um, you know, harming the wildlife that are utilizing that resource. Um, so that's that's one example of how I might review that is to basically um, figure out where the impacts are relative to a specific resource and then saying, how can we minimize that? Can we increase the buffer? Um, and, and generally speaking, um, I've had a lot of success in reviewing projects with getting people to revise limits so that they're staying out of buffer zones or moving further away from, from wetlands. Um, because as soon as we can say, well, this work is gonna cause an alteration to a resource area, then it's cause for us to sort of um, look at alternatives and what can we do to adjust or um, as similar to what Chris was saying, how a lot of times when plans come to us, they're in one form. And sometimes as with any development, a plan might be in sort of like a max build out scenario when it first comes to, to the Conservation Commission. And what we're looking to do is say, well, what alternatives have been explored? Are there any other options? Are there any ways to reduce the scope or reduce the footprint to minimize resource area impacts? Um, so with any project, that's kind of my um, protocol for reviewing it. Um, I try to look at projects holistically in terms of um, the overall impacts, but generally I'm looking at the general performance standards of the Wetlands Protection Act and our local wetland bylaw regulations to say, is this project um, meeting the performance standards? Um, under the regulations. And if it's not, then I'm basically saying, uh, how can the project be adjusted to, to meet those performance standards? Um, yeah, I'm, yeah. Hi, thank you, Aaron. Um, let me uh, go to Jack. Hi, Aaron. Uh, again, hey. thanks for your, your uh, your contribution to the white paper it was it was uh, really good to get something as thorough as that um, for us to look at. Um, something you said kind of struck me with regard to uh, you know wetlands within uh, forested areas and you know alterations with regard to light and temperature and things like that. Um, and I know you know we're going to have a, we recommend that. The minimum buffers that are suggested within the conservation commission, obviously, uh, they they have to be in place. Um, and I'm I'm just uh, thinking that there there definitely you know could be changes with regard to temperature and light, but with the size of the buffer that are are typically um, you know requested to wetlands, uh, I'm just wondering if it's if the changes would be measurable or not to that particular wetland. Um, but in theory, I agree that things change. Uh, but I'm just wondering if it's if it rises a level of something that that is, uh, you know, where we're protecting the wetlands as it is, that it really should be no change, you know, pre-production, during construction, post uh, construction to the wetlands with regard to the runoff impact on the wetlands. I mean, that's a whole idea, uh, is my understanding of. Uh, the Wetland Protection Act. So, you know, those things are sort of in place or should be in place through the purview of the Conservation Commission. Is that correct? 
Well, yes and no. So it and and really the answer is it depends. <laughs> and that's that's my answer to almost everything is it depends. <laughs> um so so we have a um for example, 50 foot no disturb around bordering vegetated wetlands, to give you an example. We have a hundred foot no disturb around vernal pools. Now we know that um, wildlife that use vernal pools travel up to 400 feet away from a vernal pool. So to your comment, Jack, um, yeah, the permit could allow clearing up to hundred feet of a vernal pool. Does that mean that there's zero impact on the vernal pool? Um, it depends, are you clear cutting completely around the entire boundary of the vernal pool? And if so, that limits basically what the organisms within that vernal pool have for upland foraging habitat. So it's a case by case situation yeah. and it really depends on the specifics of a site. And we're not just looking at runoff, we're also charged with protecting um, wildlife and making sure there's not adverse impacts to wildlife. Um, so, you know, yes, we we are looking at runoff issues. We're also looking at habitat values as well. Um, and, and many other things. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's eight interests to the Wetlands Protection Act. And um, if I had to hone in on them right away, I probably could, but, um, you know, surface and groundwater protection, um, protection from storm damage, protection of wildlife habitat. Um, oh. Yeah. Now, no, now you, you guys are really testing you, me. <laughs> you, you have good uh, good examples of where you know a buffer may not be enough. Uh, yes. So, yeah. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Let's try to um, close out um, Aaron's time and appreciate her time, but we'll go uh, with Martha and then yeah. try to uh, wrap this up. This is really helping. It sounds like you do very thorough uh, jobs. Just my only question then is, how is the border of a wetland defined? I mean, doesn't it depend on whether we have a year of drought or a year of heavy rainfall or something? But, uh, yeah, the, that's a great, that's another great question, Martha. Um, so every resource area has its own definition for um, what makes it a resource area and also how it's delineated so just to give you an example, um, bordering vegetated wetlands, which is what we commonly refer to when we say wetlands. Um, so it would be over 50% of dominant wetland species um, and also evidence of hydrology on the site, which can be hydrology visible on the site, or it can be hydrologic indicators in soils or hydric soils. Um, so there's there's multiple ways and 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 sometimes with wetlands, um, it's not always a clear, um, here's the where the wetland begins and, you know, here's where the upland begins. Sometimes there are um, areas in between that are questionable and it takes a lot of people sometimes going out there and making judgment calls as to where that boundary line will actually be flagged. Um, but we try to use sort of sound judgment um, to incorporate all areas where those indicators exist. That's just one example, but it's it's like for bank, um, there's a different definition, mean annual high water, um, first observable break and slope. So it might be like if you're looking at a river, you can see where the scour is in the bed of a river and you can see where the wetland begin or where the vegetation begins. So you can kind of see where that line of the bank is located. So there's different definitions depending on the resource. And um, uh, again, it's not always clear cut. Sometimes there's gray area and we have to use judgment in terms of where that boundary is, is actually flagged or mapped. Great. Okay. Uh, uh, Dan, uh, since we haven't heard from you. Yeah. Hi, Aaron. I was wondering, <laughs> Um, if if you could change the Conservation Commission bylaws that you work under in any way to make it easier for you to protect um, these sensitive resources, what kind of changes would you make? Well, that's a really great question. Um, you guys are you guys are really doing great with the questions. Um, so. I recently did update the um, bylaw regulation <laughs> pretty um, substantially. Um, 
and made a ton of changes. I mean, just before I even got here, there was over 800 changes that had been marked up by previous um, folks who had done review. And at all told, I mean, it was an unrecognizable document at the end. Um, but um, a couple of the things that the Conservation Commission um, established were um, limitations on the percentage of buffer in on a given property that could be altered. So they placed a 20% um, a sort of allowance. Um, and I'm please don't pick apart my semantics, but basically that in some cases they may have the, the discretion to allow up to 20% alteration of a buffer on a given site. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's not perfect where we're trying to come up with something, but basically what that's saying is that if you alter anything greater than 20%, you need to mitigate by doing something, habitat improvement, um, restoration, replication, or offsite mitigation. Um, so we've tried to sort of put the pieces in place to encourage people to do that. Um, um, a couple things that have recently come up as discussion points, which I think are really important, um, particularly for wildlife habitat protection, like time of year restrictions is a big one. Um, and, and that's something that we've been talking, um, and this is just forestry in general, like um, there's a Federal Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and and there's a couple members of the Conservation Commission who are really um, experts on the subject. But it's basically that for like a 45 day window um, during the year, um, when migratory birds are nesting, um, basically to try to protect them from um, getting killed or um, their nests destroyed. And so it's one of the things we've been talking about on permits is, well, can we tell them during this 45 day window to protect the habitat of birds that they can't, you know, cut trees during that window, for example. That's just like one example, but, you know, we also have the, um, and this is an important piece too, is that whenever there's a project that falls within natural heritage um, estimated or priority habitat, the project would go to review by the state and that the state would put conditions on the permit as well. So they would put additional conditions that might require a specific protection plan for the given species that utilizes the property. Um, and so there's additional uh, sort of protections that come into place if any of those critical habitats are impacted by a given project. Great. Okay. Um Great, Janet. I'll give you one more um, opportunity here, and then we're going to close close this out with Aaron. So I I, I do feel a little um, cross examine for you, Aaron. So Aaron, I because I'm trying to get. So you, you basically in your comments you said you think that cutting in the forest um, combined with you know increased rain and increased drought is going to have an adverse effect. Um, should will have an adverse effect on the quality of our drinking water. And so that that was kind of the point where you disagreed with, or Jack disagreed with you, but you weren't here. And so I just want, that's that's what I thought was interesting or alarming or, you know, and you had very specific studies that you cited. So I just- Yeah, so I just, I, 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 I totally hear what you're saying, Janet. I totally get your concern. I wanna just make something super clear. That paper was not my personal opinion. That paper was me citing research that had been done on these subject matter to basically present that as sort of food for thought for the Water um, Quality Protection Committee, um, because there are there are there is published data and research on all of these subject matter that. Um, has findings that have certain findings that are relevant to the discussion and so what I was doing was basically presenting those um, peer-reviewed research papers that have um, findings that were relevant to the discussion. Um, I did not intend to have to say, <laughs> you know, Erin Jock is stating that she believes X, Y, and Z. It's more so here is here is published research that shows X, Y, and Z, um, and to present that to you in that fashion. So my goal was to do it without having an opinion to say, this is what the research shows. 
Yeah, I guess I guess I'm not I'm not asking. I, I understand what you're saying. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Of course. Great. And um, yeah, and I think that 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 paper is in our packet um, uh, as a resource. And when we get to those issues, uh, I think it's important. I think we did look at somewhat at that paper and there's um, part of the issue is is how applicable is that um, was that study to um, Amherst conditions versus um, sort of the national conditions that they were looking at. But um, yes. but yeah, it's an important resource uh, amongst uh, others that we um, should should um, have under consideration. Laura. Yeah, just one final comment. I would say that, you know, having worked with Aaron for the past three years and just in general with the Conservation Commission, um, I really want to stay away from any blanket statements because one thing that I've certainly learned, and Aaron, I'm sure you'll support this, is that everything is on a case-by-case -case basis. There's not one size fits all. It's the particular resource. It's, you know, there's, I have not seen one permit or one one item coming from the uh, Conservation Commission that's like, oh, this is exactly the same as the one we worked on before. Um, so I want to make sure we're staying away from that one. Yeah, and to piggyback on what Laura said, I completely agree. And there was a comment in the white paper that said something to the effect of um, solar development is less impactful than subdivision development. And my comment in response to that was it's you're not comparing apples to apples, right? There are different types of development. It's different infrastructure. It's always dangerous to generalize and say one thing is better than another. So that's why every project is looked at with a fresh set of eyes. And it's not to necessarily judge a given project. Um, it's good or bad or, you know, worse than another. It's looking at the project to see where it complies and sort of where there are issues um, for a site specific conditions. And um, I think that's really what it comes down to is looking at site specific conditions for every single project and figuring out where are the vulnerabilities and how do we um, put conditions and our powers really in conditioning the project. How do we develop conditions to protect the resource areas? Um, so that's a big part of, I think, the overall process. Okay, excellent. Yeah, and thank you. And that's um, uh, thank you, Aaron, for your time um, and your um, expertise in this area. Um, as we move forward, we may have some more questions for you, but uh, but this has been uh, really um, educational for me, and I think others. <clears throat> um, and as uh, Stephanie says, we're lucky to have you. So um, uh, thank you for your time, and we'll we'll move on to the next agenda item. You're welcome to. Stay with us, but um, uh, no need as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nice to see everyone. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Okay, so um, uh, we'll also go uh, move, move uh, the discussion on the solar survey in the final draft um, with Adrian at GZA, again, who is joining us to, to help us through this um, uh, uh, discussion. Um, basically, at this point, we need to move on uh, for two reasons. One is because we have a lot more to do uh, and to focus on with regard to the bylaw itself. Uh, and then second, because um, the survey needs to go out and the public engagement needs to basically start um, uh, within within the week or two. Uh, and so um, we have had um, several rounds of uh, opportunities to provide feedback and comments to uh, Stephanie and to uh, to, to GZA on the survey. Um, I applaud um, both Stephanie and, and GZA for um, substantial upgrades to the uh, survey that reflect comments from, from this body as well as uh, other bodies. Uh, and I think the survey uh, now is in, in the version three uh, and maybe that's 3.1 uh, because there was an additional, uh, some additional edits um, that came out of the uh, ECAC committee uh, that um, have been in, uh, incorporated. Um, and um, uh, while no survey is perfect, uh, we're here today to basically give um, uh, not approval, uh, but to um, vote um, ultimately uh, after we sort of talk a little bit about the survey. Um, uh, that it is complete and we're ready to move forward um, uh, from from here. Uh, so 
Um, Stephanie, did you want to just quickly uh, introduce Adrian again, and, and then um, uh, is, the, is the idea is Adrian is going to sort of introduce the new version? I think Adrian is just going to summarize her most recent yeah. edits. Great. Um, okay, I'm members, not sure so... she needs an introduction. <laughs> no, I don't think I need to introduce her. I just <laughs> Adrian, who needs no introduction. Yep. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Great. Um, well, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, as Dwayne said, I did receive comments from members of um, the ECAC and this group on version two. Um, those comments were largely integrated um, in the form of, they primarily were kind of text language changes versus you know wholesale um, question addition and removals. So they were um, largely integrated um some of the kind of bigger picture changes was there was a reduction in the total type of questions asked so simplified to fewer um types of you know dragging and sorting and multiple choice um on the you know ranking from agree to disagree we added some additional statements where so, so sometimes agreeing is more regulations and sometimes agreeing is less regulations so that people can really think about it and not go, you know, okay, yeah, agree, 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 agree. Um, it, it'll hopefully make them think a little bit more about what they are agreeing to. Um, and then, so those were kind of the, the larger holistic changes. Other than that, there were a lot of text revisions to clarify things, simplify language so that the survey is very approachable to the public. Um, and then I did receive this week a couple of revisions from the ECAC, and those were also um, integrated in, um, again, they were kind of a couple of tweaks on some options. Um, and I did receive a comment from um, Martha about adding in some definition of net zero, which was done. So that those are the updates. Um, one outstanding item that uh, will require a little bit of discussion in this group is that on question, and I believe, there's a statement um, about, sorry, I'm just scrolling to it to make sure I don't misspeak. Could, could we see the questions on the screen, please? Um, yes, I can. Stephanie, do you want to, uh, or, um, or Adrian, do you have the- Adrian link? Kim, but we're not, I don't think we're going through these question by question. Yeah. So if you could just scroll to that one question. Sorry, the bar is in the way of making this. There we go. All right, question 10. Um, this option, so the question asks um, the participant to rank the statements about where they would like to see solar um, constructed within the unbuilt environment. And the option of no solar development should occur on open land. Um, I received one piece of feedback that added the statement, even if this means estab missing established renewable energy targets. That was added between versions two and three. And then I also received feedback saying to remove that statement. And so because that conflict, that, that feedback is directly in conflict, um, I'm bringing that to the committee to clarify which piece of feedback to implement. Great, okay. So any um, comments on that specific question number uh, 10? Uh, and particularly with regard to that last uh, or that added uh, phrase at the end. Dwayne Martha has her hand raised. Yeah. 
Yep. Yep. Okay. Martha. And then uh, uh, we'll go with Martha. I didn't see the order. So we'll go with Martha, Laura, and then Janet. Yeah. I was one of the ones who flagged that statement. Uh, trouble is I don't have a really brilliant idea of how to rephrase it, but it seems that it's too extreme because established renewable energy targets from our state climate action plan, you know, mean having to balance you know, the le legitimate le need for lots of solar with also the legitimate need for uh, the carbon sequestration. And so that uh, it, it seems too extreme, you know, it seems to me that you might want to say something more, more like uh, solar development on and open land is too extreme because it could include everything from gravel pits to a pristine forest or something. Say something more along the lines that only limited solar development on, you know, pristine lands or forests and wetlands or something or rather uh, in, you know, even sort of along the lines of, of trying to balance the solar and the um, and the carbon sequestration or just leave that whole um, bill, little bullet out. Uh, you know, I'm sorry to say I couldn't come up with a brilliant uh, wording, but I certainly think that this is uh, not appropriate here. It should say more something more like limited solar development and then define what you mean by open land. And it say, even if this calls into question or something, the balance between you know solar and uh, and land preservation or or something. <laughs> Sorry, can't be better. Yeah, go ahead, um, Laura. No, my question was just to you, Adrian. You know. We, um, you know, I, I want to defer to you in terms of what language you think is best. You know, I think our role here is to, you know, help with the creation of these questions, not necessarily to write them. So I'm, I'm curious your feedback on the best way to reconcile um, this matter. Um, I, you know, I, I support removing that statement, but leaving, you know, this question is asking where in the unbuilt environment should it go? And so I think people should have the option to say nowhere. <laughs> Canopy and rooftop only. And that's what this option you know, allows is, is to them to say nowhere, not forest, not ag, no built environment, no unbuilt environment. And some people may feel that way and they should have the opportunity to, to make that their top ranked location. Um, I think that there is always a trade-off, you know, if the only on the built environment means less solar overall. Um, but I do think there should be an option of, you know, no, no unbuilt environment. Um, so I think that, you know, we could remove the, even if this myth means missing established renewable targets, um, but we should leave the option for people to flat out say no solar, you know, over earth, only solar over pavement and buildings, um, which mm -hmm. was the intent. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 I'm sorry to go out of order, but um, I should have had my hand up in my mind at least. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I guess I, I, I put, there is the option. You can say no solar development anywhere. Uh, but but uh, you have to recognize that, that that it may may come at the um, expense of of not meeting uh, so, some 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 goals, um, uh, and so um, I, I just just that the, the extra phrase in my mind at least provoke people not to just jumping that to conclusion because I, I think you know generally why wouldn't you not want solar development you know if unless you know if there wasn't any recognize if there wasn't any reason to if there wasn't any recognized trade-off um I, I i'm a little bit concerned about people just going for that option uh because it's the um it's the easiest and most maybe most obvious option if you're not thinking about um the reason why we need to um 
uh, try to um, support solar generally for the for the climate purpose. But uh, but I'll I'll see, hear what other people have to say. Um, Daniel. Yeah, um, I was thinking if it's really important that people consider the trade-off um, when thinking about their answer to this question, what if we moved that statement up into the question instead of the answer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So saying something to the effect of like, um, with the understanding that any limits on solar development may impact uh, ton of average ability to achieve um, established renewable energy targets, where would you, yeah, where would you most prefer? Mm -hmm. That way, like, it, we're not, I guess we're not kind of guiding people away from one specific answer. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, uh, notwithstanding my last comment, uh, I support that approach, but I think it should be in there. It, it should be in there just to um, when people think about their answer, uh, have that trade-off in mind. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I don't know who was first, so Martha? <laughs> yeah, I, I think I could support sort of what Dan was saying or Dwayne, what you were saying. You know, if the wording was changed, uh, don't say even if it means missing established renewable energy targets, say even if it means you know, not meeting our uh, Amherst's goals for for solar or something something like that, instead of saying established renewable energy goals, make it specifically refer to the the goals that Amherst had set for our solar. Does that make sense? Uh, maybe Stephanie, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think we've set solar goals particularly. We've set uh, greenhouse gas mitigation goals. Correct. But also, you're also setting solar goals according to our the last meeting you had. <laughs> it's recommended. It's not setting yeah. goals. It's it's just recommended. Um, the recommended portion of what that might look like, in view of the state's bigger goals, but it is not a target. It is just a recommended. Uh, or identified threshold that we might want to consider, but it's not a goal. Well, well, you could say, if you use the word recommended, I could accept that instead of saying established, uh, or whatever the wording is. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether the, the public taking the survey would at the point that they're taking the survey would know anything about this recommendation yet is one, one issue. Uh, okay. Um, Janet. Um, I think that by putting that clause on that option, it's putting your finger on the scale. Um, and you could put that clause on anything, you know, including rooftop solar, you know, small and things like that. So I don't think it's, I think by putting it there, it's, it's just, kind of pushing people away from that position. And the goal of the survey is to figure out what are people, residents in Amherst think? What do they support? Where do they support it? Um, I think that that should just be deleted. Um, I have, I don't know that the town council is going to set up priorities or goals for solar. So I, I don't think that's kind of our job to say that, you know, they will adopt that. So I would, um, I mean, to me, it seems sort of obvious that, if we don't build solar, we're gonna, and we need to, you know, reduce greenhouse gases, we have to get it from other, some other source or something like that. There's a trade-off, but I wouldn't just put the trade-off point on one factor. It doesn't make sense. I also am very concerned about the ranking questions because we wanna know what people think and where they support solar, not, and then you're by ranking, you're forcing people to pick one over the other and so somebody could easily say, um, I, I'm, I strongly support, um, you know, seeing, so, you know, I, I, I most, I, I don't know, but most prefer to see large scale solar. Um, I guess actually I would probably do least prefer, but I just think that we have these, you know, just ask them what they think of each type of use 
you know, where solar is, like strongly agree, agree, neutral, you know, disagree, strongly disagree, um, no opinion. This is what the professionals have said. You're asking people to, they might strongly support it in two of the spots, but not against each other. And so I have no idea. I didn't see any surveys that had ranking questions. Um, and then also sometimes the ranking questions put in two factors or two ideas, and you're kind of assuming the person supports one or the other or both. I just don't think we get a lot from that. I think we should just stick with the quest, the strongly agree, agree, you know, disagree, whatever that we see in the DOER, we see it in the UMass extension recommendations. I just, I'm just, I think that's a, you know, I don't know what we get from this. I also don't understand why lakes and ponds, is that a place that we could put solar given our state laws? So I'll, Dwayne, can I respond? Yes, please. Okay, so lakes and ponds is um, coming. <laughs> it is, um, you know, so in, in, under the state wetland law, what is protected in terms of a lake or a pond is the land under the water and the land around the water. So just like you're allowed to permit aerators in ponds that have, you know, limited impacts on the land under the water, um, in terms of running the utilities to them, solar could be permitted that way. And floating solar is um, it is coming, um, and it's highly effective. I've I've seen other um, projects proposed in other states, so that's not really on the table right this moment. But it is um, on the horizon of solar development. Um, so I I do think it's worth leaving that in there. Um, We've also gone with these ranking statements so that people are thinking about trade-offs and they are making decisions about where they support it and where they don't support it. Um, instead of asking a long series of, you know, what about for us, agree, disagree? What about um, farmland, agree, disagree? Um, because we can get at the heart of the issue of the trade-off of would you rather have it in a forest or would you rather have it on ag land? Would you rather have it here or there? Um, makes people think critically about those trade-offs and about the land use and about what they wanna see um, versus asking a whole series. You could say, you know, I don't want it in forests. I don't want it on ag land. I don't want it on meadows. Um, and at the end of the day, you've thought about them each discreetly. But what your conclusion is that you maybe didn't intend is, as you've selected that you would like to see it nowhere um, on the unbuilt environment. And here you can still make that preference known, but I think that, but it's a, it's a more active choice to make it known instead of a series of more passive choices um, coming to a conclusion. Uh, there's also evidence on having those, you know, agree, disagree, um, neutral. A lot of people do like to disagree. Um, that was actually a comment that was really great from the ECAC about this acquiescence bias um, that people agree more often than they disagree. And so, again, by putting the choices, um, you know, by making you rank, there's that tension between the choices and it's a really active decision about where you want to see it. Um, and it's it's really considering the town holistically instead of just one kind of resource area or land use at a time. Um, you have to think about all the land uses um, kind of in tandem and make that decision. Um, the other Thank you. Question, I had another issue about um, the undeveloped open space language versus open land. Um, one of the things is we have a lot of fields in open land, you know, and most of that is prime agricultural soils or soils of statewide concern. And a lot of that has been converted to farmland since I've moved here 20 years ago. And so a meadow and a field also is very, very likely in Amherst to have some of the best soils in the state. And so I wondered if you could put a, like maybe say open you know, fields or meadows with prime farm soils or better to, to say, 
you know, because I think maybe putting into people's minds that these are future agricultural fields and very, you know, in my experience, kind of very likely given all the new farming that has happened in the last 20 years. So, you know, maybe a separate category for that, because let me let me I appreciate that, Janet. And what I would suggest, um, again, I don't we kind of there's sort of a trade-off of too many options and so forth and parsing different options. You have open lands with good soils, open lands without good soils, and it kind of gets a little bit uh maybe overwhelming. And I'm not sure whether the public, the general public we're looking at really um can um understand the nuances and and the um uh and and sort of the uh, future uses of these different types of land. I think we're kind of getting for sort of primary uh, and, and sort of thoughts from from the public uh, more more generally. I would suggest that we, uh, with these comments, uh, which have been helpful, uh, leave it to um, the expertise of, of Adrian and, and GZA to um, take these under account, uh, under uh, uh, into account, and and finalize the survey at this point. Um, my one little addition to the to the uh, small issues is I I would consider maybe taking lakes and ponds out um, only because um, it may be confusing to people. I if I I don't know Amherst in its complete entirety, but I, I I'm not I, I'm struggling except for Puffer's Pond where I don't think yeah. we're gonna, uh, alarm people to th think we're going to put uh, solar on Puffer's Pond. I don't know if we have any other lakes or ponds that would be appropriate. I do know, Adrian, following the literature, there is interest in this. There's actually in work around the world that is pretty advanced. California is very interested uh, for for um, to reduce evaporation and so forth. But I don't think it, I, I my sense is it's not really applicable or necessary to have listed. Uh, uh, it may screw up some of the rankings. Um, uh, in, in Amherst, uh, just my my thought. But I think we'll leave all that um, to you uh, as a uh, and to 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 wrap this up. Um, and um, with that, we'd really like to um, move forward uh, uh, beyond the survey and 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 uh, uh, leave it up to um, GZA and and Stephanie to um, advance the survey and get it out there and and, and orchestrate it. Uh, what we would like to do, um, and Stephanie would like us to do, is as a body uh, to vote on the survey uh, as we've seen it uh, as this last version, subject to some uh, 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 modifications based on the conversation today and the expertise of uh, GZA, uh, that we take a vote on this survey, that we are uh, consider it to be uh, complete uh, and ready to move forward. Uh, we're not approving it. That's not our job. Uh, uh, but we are just uh, wanting to uh, put it to bed, if you will, call it complete and pass it on to the to the town. St Stephanie, do you want to add to that or, or any other comments? Uh, the only comment I wanted to say is that um, this is the third version of the survey that's gone out and that um, members were given the opportunity for comment and there were multiple comments from um, from this body, especially from from Martha and Janet, that were incorporated into the third version. Um, also, Dwayne, um, you had submitted comments, I think, for each draft as well. So, um, and I think maybe Jack might have had some in the earlier first version. So, I do want to say that there has been ample opportunity for people to weigh in and give comment and and it's really strengthened the survey. So, you know, I think um, both, you know, Martha and Janet especially had very extensive comments that got incorporated. So it's really been a, it's a stronger survey because of their input. But I, I mean, as the project manager for the assessment and working with the consultant, I need to keep this moving forward now. Um, you know, we only have a certain budget. We only have a certain amount of time. This is the third version and we really need to wrap this up and move it forward. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. Yep. Agreed. Okay. Um, Dan, I'll give you one more, one more uh, quick comment. And then I want to see if there's a motion to uh, accept these, um, uh, accept the, this uh, last version. You know, I, I appreciate that um, there have been adjustments to um, the survey. I still think it's confusing. I think um, it's, it's, 
there's sort of a bias in certain questions and um, particularly in the regulatory statements section and the project review, I think there's like entire things that should be taken out. Like, um, you know, the, the first one in 11, this, this, this zoning bylaw should create strict regulations where solar can be constructed and exist in, a, in addition to existing laws and regulations, i.e. current zoning wetlands and environmental regulations. I don't even know what environmental regulations, I don't know what's strict. I, you know, I don't even know what the purpose of that is because we've been asked to write a bylaw by the town council. And, you know, that sounds like, oh, we're doing an onerous addition. And then there's a similar question about, um, you know, you know, treat it like anything else or not worse than anything else. And, and, it, and it just, just from being very intimately aware from the zoning bylaw, I don't see how that's going to help because the zoning bylaw is 200 pages long. It regulates everything differently and has special regulations. And so a lot of these questions seem to be sort of creating like a, a kind of a boogeyman thing of like, oh, there's going to be more regulations. There shouldn't be anything in addition to, you know, state act, zoning bylaw, and the mysterious environmental regulations. I don't know what that refers to. And so I would love to support this survey. And I would love to have had, you know, more kind of comments or criticisms or changes put into it. And I would have loved that this group could have sit down and looked at questions and do what we just did with um, the previous question, because it's a better question because the group discussed it. So I'm just kind of upset. I, I just don't understand, like, there's still so much wrong, really, with the questions that we're really focused on what we're going to be doing, which is writing a bylaw and trying to understand what people's preferences are. All right, thank you for that. Um, Laura? Yeah, just really quickly. My, you know, the way I look at this and um, I feel like this group has had ample time to comment on these survey questions. And um, the town has worked diligently to find a third party consultant who is their trade to draft these types of questions. And we need to get this survey out. Um, in fact, I was looking at the timeline articulated in the last meeting and it should have already been completed by now. Um, so, uh, you know, our role here based on my read of the charter was that we were going to help with the survey. We weren't going to draft the survey. Um, so given that I am ready to, you know, to, to move on and vote and, and uh, hopefully pass this so we can, we can get on with the rest of our work. Thank you, Laura. Um, uh, that sounded almost like a motion, uh, but I would entertain a motion to- um, I'll make a motion, Dwayne. Okay, can you articulate the motion? Yes, I'll, I'll make a motion to pass the survey version three um, as approved. Great, okay. Uh, uh, Jack. I'll second. Great, thank you. All right, and Stephanie, do you wanna take the vote? Sure, and in no particular order, Jemsek? Uh, approved. Um, so it's a vote yes. 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 No or abstain, sorry. Um, Corcoran? Yes. Hanner? Abstain. McGowan? I, you're muted. I'm gonna abstain also. I don't think it's ready. Okay, Breger? Yes. Brooks? Yes. Pagliarulo? Yes. Okay, the motion passes. And thank okay, you all. Great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, for shepherding this through uh, with us. And, and Adrian, uh, great. Thank you for all your work on it. And we look forward to um, uh, it going out and, uh, and taking a look at uh, maybe responding ourselves, uh, but also taking a look at the results um, uh, when they become available um, in a while. Thank you. Thank you all for your input and time. Great. Okay. Um, let's return to the agenda. Uh, and, and go to the top of the agenda uh, and do some of the uh, uh, administrative things first. And then we'll move on to um, the bylaw. Uh, and what I can or I'm not sure about promise, but really encourage uh, moving forward now that kind of this uh, engagement 
activity is behind us uh, is to really start focusing the bulk of our meeting each week on the bylaw. Uh, and we may not be able to accomplish that this week uh, because it's already, uh, what do we have, about 40 minutes left and we say half an hour left and we want to get to some public input. Um, okay, but we do have these administrative things we need to get done. So we do have um, uh, meeting, uh, minutes uh, to approve, uh, to review and, and, and approve. Uh, we have the uh, the, the uh, January twenty mi minutes. Um, my understanding, Stephanie, is the this uh, or the now somewhat historic minutes of uh, January six are still um, in work, and we'll hopefully get to that next meeting. Correct. Yeah, great. Um, but do we have any um, uh, discussion uh, on the minutes as drafted for January twentieth, uh, or a motion to approve? Mm -hmm. uh, Martha. I move that we approve the minutes from the January 20th meeting as submitted. Thank you. Is there a second for that? I, I didn't read them, so I, I'm not going to participate. Okay. Um, I, I did, and I'll second if I'm able to do that. Okay, so um, in no apparent order, Gemsec. Jack, can you unmute? Are you there? Okay, I'll go to Cor flowers. Corcoran. Speak for yourself. <laughs> uh, Hanner. Approve. McGowan. Abstain. Gregor. Yes. Brooks. Yes. Pagliarulo. Yes. And Gemsec, I think we've lost Jack. <laughs> Going to the sunflowers. <laughs> um, the happier. I mean, they they pass anyhow. They pass as they stand, but I but we do need Jack to vote. Okay, well maybe so we'll we'll uh, come back to that. Table it for a second, um, mm -hmm. and move to uh, staff updates. Um, anything on your end, Stephanie, and then Chris. Uh, obviously, uh, we'll get to the bylaw in a moment. I think, you know, the next steps are um, that Adrian and I will meet to schedule, uh, we'll be scheduling the um, community outreach sessions soon, and we'll share the dates um, and locations with you all. Great. Yep. So, and Jack is back. Yep. Jack, you want to um, uh, add your vote to um, the uh, uh, approval of the minutes from 120? Yes. Yes, sorry about that. I, I, I did take a call. This is the, the dangers of Zoom. I guess I wouldn't have done that <laughs> in a live meeting. But <laughs> yep. sorry. Yep. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Okay. Um, anything from the planning department, Chris? It does, isn't to do with the bylaw uh, that we'll get to in a moment. I don't have any updates. No. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, 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 how about any from any of the committees that we liaise from? Um, I'll have one from ECAC. Uh, maybe I'll start with that. Uh, so at the ECAC Energy and Climate Action Committee meeting um, on Wednesday, uh, the committee did approve a memo uh, that will be forthcoming to the Solar Working Solar Bylaw Working Group. Um, I suspect um, in the packet for next meeting uh, that provides a, a as was referenced uh, by Stephanie, I think earlier, uh, does provide. A, an, an, a, an analysis uh, of to help a conversation with regard to the scale of ground mounted solar energy that we might look to accommodate uh, in Amherst, uh, at least with uh, 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 as it pertains to a metric uh, that looks at our quote unquote fair share of ground mounted solar compared to what the Commonwealth as a whole is anticipating as um, the, the uh, projection uh, and the range of projections uh, for the need for ground mounted solar, not uh, considering all the other solar on the built environment, but what is really gonna be um, likely necessary for ground mounted solar uh, by 2050. 
again in their 20 from their 2050 uh, decarbonization roadmap. Uh, we took a look at that uh, and did some uh, basic an analysis on that with regard to our fair share uh, with re with regard to strictly um, our percentage of, of uh, land um, uh, that is uh, in Amherst compared to the entire uh, Commonwealth and scaling that to to uh, that Commonwealth need to Amherst needs. Um, and so there are some useful outcomes on that with regard to uh, ultimately what sort of scale of of um, not only megawatts but acreage of uh, of land uh, we might uh, try to think about um, as we develop these uh, these uh, zoning bylaws uh, that we should keep in mind uh, or that we might keep in mind as we um, move the uh, move the 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 bylaw conversation going forward. I won't get into the um, results of that because that will be in the in the forthcoming memo, uh, but I think it'll be um, can be part of a helpful conversation. Um, any other, uh, and Chris, you have a, um, a comment. Thank you. Um, I, I wondered to whom will you send that? Will you send that to the solar bio working group? Yeah, the, the, it's the memo as we approved it was, it was addressed to, or to, uh, this, this working group, uh, and to the town council and to the town manager. Uh, and so my guess is it'll be distributed via Stephanie uh, to those bodies. Thank you. Great. Um, any other updates from any of the other committees? Mm -hmm. Super. Okay, great. Um, let's then move on to um, the uh presentation and review of the of the uh, um, of the uh, draft drafting that uh, um, Chris has provided uh, from the planning department um, and what I'd like to um, introduce and this where this came up uh, I forget where this came up before but it seemed like a, a, a good suggestion um, in um, as as um, Chris and her department come up come forward with with draft language for us to to work from um i think maybe as as a as a goal for scheduling going forward uh it would be uh, my proposal i guess is to um have chris each week uh, or sorry uh, each meeting um to the extent that she's uh has has the ability to do so uh is um that we have sort of look at each uh, draft language in two steps. Uh, first is uh, what we might call a first reading. Uh, and we sort of have been doing this so far is that even though us as a as a working group may not have had too much time to review the draft yet, uh, maybe just a few days, uh, maybe maybe more depending on when the when when the packet becomes available, but that we would spend time at each meeting uh, to do a first reading. Uh, I actually appreciate Chris reading through the document because it really helps to understand it and clarify it. Uh, and we do that as a first reading. Uh, we uh, allows us to to digest it, make some initial, uh, provide some initial thoughts on it. Uh, but also, we don't want to think about that as our uh, one and only opportunity to really um, provide uh, discussion and comment on on the on the uh, drafting. Uh, so the idea would be each week to have uh, some new section of the uh, bylaw, again, to the extent that Chris is able to provide um, some additional drafting. Uh, we'd have uh, that section as a first reading, and then we would return uh, to the uh, drafting that was first read at the previous meeting, uh, and we've all had a chance to digest it, think about it, and 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 potentially even do some track changes or or um, edits uh, to that uh, to then uh, or some discussion questions on it that we can then spend um, a, a decent chunk of time uh, discussing that as maybe what we would call a second reading uh, or a review second or a review uh, of that uh, drafting and then try to sort of finalize it um, and move 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 on in sequence to the next uh, to the next section. Um, 
and then obviously once everything starts coming together towards the end, have a review of, of the of it in its entire in its entirety. Uh, so that's my uh, proposal to try to um, stick with that type of approach as we go forward now in earnest with the drafting. Um, does that sound first um, like reasonable to you, Chris? Um, and then um, and whether there's precedence for doing this and other um, venues, uh, but then other pe any other people's thoughts in terms of this approach? I think it sounds reasonable to me, and I will be able to put more time into um, drafting in the future. But um, when I when I have my turn to start talking about this, I wanted to report on some research that I've done. So, Super. yes, that sounds reasonable. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yep. Any other thoughts? Um, yeah, I see Janet. Actually, I have two, a thought, but I want to ask Chris, when you're doing these sections, are you like looking at different bylaws and then trying to like do the best language or are you just, you know, basing it mostly on Cape Cod or because um, what would be helpful to me would be sort of like alternatives. Like I know you picked this, but if I knew, you know, Cape Cod was saying we're not Cape Cod because it's not, it's not a town like Cape Cod says this, but Belchertown has something much more specific or Shootsbury has, you know, much more specific stuff on slopes. Like, so in a way, like, what am I looking at? I wonder, like compared to what could be there. Um, so are, are you, you know, it, do you know what I'm saying? Yes, I'm doing that. I just don't know if I'm going to have time to, you know, provide that information or describe it to everyone. Um, I can tell you the bylaws that I've looked at, um, and maybe that is something that I can do, but I don't really feel like I have the time to pick out, you know, what's different about this, what's different about that. I can refer you to sections of different um, towns bylaws. Yeah, because some people are very detailed. Some bylaws are very detailed on certain points and others are very mm -hmm. general. And so, you know, like I would want to know like what's out there kind of thing. So that, that's just one comment. The second comment is, Dwayne, I think your thing sounds logical, but it actually, I'm, I'm struggling with these drafts and how they all relate to together. And so one of my questions were, you know, is this reporting and monitoring? Like where's the section for ongoing monitoring? And so I'm having trouble I would. I think the first reading makes sense, and our questions make sense, and Chris could write those in. But I, I, it's hard for me to understand what we're talking about. I feel like I have like the nose of the camel and its right flank, but I'm not really sure how it's all fitting together. And so I don't. I'd hate to vote and say, "Yeah, this is great," when I really don't know what the rest looks like. And I think Chris is laughing because I think it makes sense to her. <laughs> well, I would just say that um, I don't think that we were going to necessarily vote on this, but. Um, um, we did. We, uh, there, there is an outline that's been drafted and shared with us. I think Chris put together. Um, maybe we should um, take some time to sort of uh, everybody make sure that they're kind of aware of of the of the entire camel, if you will, um, uh, and sort of where and sort of each week sort of okay here now we're in this in this section and and so forth just to add that context if that if that might be might be helpful. Um, but let me go with Jack. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I, I guess my approach would be that I think it's incumbent on all of us to what we're going to have some knowledge of what other towns are doing, what other, you know, regional commissions have done, Cape Cod, Pioneer Valley, and that's on each of us to take that information. And I think what we get is it, it is, um, it, it is what it is. And we judge it on, you know, what, uh, you know, Chris has done quite a bit of this in her, in her, uh, you know, experience as as a planner, uh, and then we just we just take it at face value. But I don't really care about the 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 details of this and that unless you know there's a question. I'm, I'm sure Chris can uh, come up with the explanation. But I, you know, I mean, I <laughs> I don't want to make this a science project. Basically, you know, I just feel like it's a bylaw. It's going to be good, and I, you know, some town, you know, in Massachusetts has this. I, I'm not sure. I really care, um, unless, you know, someone else in the group, you know, brings it 
to light that, hey, should we think about this? And that's fine. But um, I, I just, I think we're going to get real clunky here if we're trying to like <laughs> take everything available to us, all the information that's out there and try to consider all of it in our, you know, local bylaw for this. I just think that's, <laughs> that's, we're not going to get anywhere doing that. Uh, and I have a lot of confidence in Chris uh, and in this, you know, committee, this work group. Um, that we'll ferret out and get the best bylaw we can. Thanks, Jack. Um, Chris, did you have a comment on, on that? Or, yeah, or... I just wanted to say that um, different towns are different, and I think we've come across this before. Um, we want a bylaw that's relative to Amherst. And, you know, I've I read, and this would be part of my um, update, which is that I read like 10 or 12 bylaws in the last week. <laughs> and um, many of them are very simple and very bare bones and were written, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Some of them are very detailed and specific and were just adopted last week or two weeks ago. Um, and each of them is specific to the types of things that are happening in their town, the type of um, land cover they have, the type of development they have, the amount of, um, of solar that they already have on their land. And so each town is dealing with this in its own way. And I think Amherst should deal with it in its own way. And um, Shootsbury, for instance, is a great bylaw for Shootsbury, but Shootsbury is primarily on wells. Almost the whole town is on wells. Almost the whole town is forested. They have very little agricultural land. It's really a different environment from Amherst. So I think although we can read through these other bylaws and take what we can from them, um, we really have to look specifically at our town. So that's what I have to say. Thank you, Chris. Um, Martha and then Laura. Yeah, I was just going to uh, agree basically with Jack. I mean, it's our responsibility as members of the committee if we want to study all the other bylaws and compare them and think about it and so on. But Chris is, you know, she's doing the research. She's real experienced. She's going to give us a great, great draft of everything that uh, there'll just be, I think, a few uh, specific questions, again, that are relevant to Amherst. So I think that, uh, Dwayne, your original suggestion of we make and eventually two passes through it is fine. Great, thank you. Uh, Laura? No, I was just gonna say, basically echoing what Martha and Jack had said, which was, I agree with that approach. I think I have total trust in Chris. She's a professional, she's been doing this for years. And then also equal faith in this group to review the language and make sure everything seems reasonable and is reflective of you know, what we think and sort of what we've heard from the community. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, Janet, I, I presume an echo again, right? <laughs> Actually not. Um, so <laughs> I, I'm interested in like knowing what, what bylaws Chris is looking to, like what does she think is most like us? And then I, I would need more time. And so these, these meetings are my planning board weeks. And so I often only have like a day to look at something. And so I'm happy to do the work and look at you know other bylaws. I'm not going to look at 90, but I I I have you know I have a bunch of bylaws that I have been looking at. So I need more time to to that you know. And but it, but Chris, are there specific towns that you think are like us that you know we have farms, we have some forests, we have um, you know lots of conserved land, and you know a crazy amount of students in some village centers. Is there someone like us? Is North? I can send you a list of towns that I've looked at and some of them were chosen because they were like us and some of them were chosen because I thought they would be more um, perhaps sophisticated in their approach to this or okay. um, more, you know, have more progress in their approach or whatever, but I can send you a list. Thanks. Great. And we're all struggling with time to, to uh, review uh, what what Chris provides, and I, I think with this first reading and then second reading, it gives everybody a week, between uh, sorry two weeks uh, 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 between the first reading and and then to really dig into some conversation about it in the second uh, two weeks later. Uh, so we're all going to have to um, uh, uh, we're all going to have to 
you know, rev review these on uh, in, in that time frame, uh, as well as uh, do our own research, as Jack suggested, or others, um, that, um, you know, if we want to uh, sort of research a certain area and, and get our own uh, sort of review of what other bylaws have said about specific issues, that's, that's on, on, on us um, uh, to bring that to, to the to the group at that second reading. Okay, um, let me move move to Stephanie, and then we're going to move forward um, uh, to to Chris to introduce us. I I suspect we're going to start this process of, of first reading and second reading next time, Chris. Uh, but maybe um, uh, you can get us started with uh, with sort of the um, discussion you wanted to to introduce us. Um, introduce us uh, to but let's Stephanie did you still very quick all yeah. I was going to suggest is that um, Chris the list go to everyone so that oh, sure. everyone can yes. have okay. an opportunity okay. to look yeah. at that and I'm happy to to get that out if it's yeah yeah, yeah perfect challenging so yeah okay great um, with with um, really the need to to st st end promptly at one uh, with the need to or or, or desire to have uh, stop at 1250 uh, for a public comment um, let's move on to Chris. Um, uh, and Chris, you sort of indicated that you had some some sort of thoughts to provide before jumping into the into the drafting. Um, well, I, I sort of shared my thoughts already okay. that um, I've looked at you know ten or twelve bylaws in the last week or so, and that they're all different and they're all you know different towns. I used um, Shutesbury as an example, but I also want to use Athol as an example. So Athol is very eager to get. Um, more tourists into town. That was a way that they think that they can boost their economy. And so they've geared their bylaw um, in that direction. And, you know, Amherst has a lot of other things going on. So, you know, we have other considerations. So I think that we really need to think about, well, what is important to Amherst and what things do we want to protect and what is our responsibility to participate in having solar arrays in our town, and all of those things are going to come into um, into play when we're talking about our bylaw. So um, that's really all I wanted to say. That we can't really m mirror somebody else's bylaw in our town because we're different. So um, if you want to, we can start where we left off last time, which was the. Um, the section on, well, it starts out with monitoring and maintenance. And we did get through monitoring and maintenance and we got through modifications and we got through transfer of ownership. And we yep. stopped right after transfer of ownership. So following the pattern that Duane suggested, we could start today with abandonment or decommissioning if that would be suitable. I think that would be great. And and, and maybe we can get through this, through this, um section which is a few more uh, a few more well more than a few more paragraphs uh but but a read through that a first read through that and then we can uh bring this up for um a second review and discussion next time and to the extent that you have additional drafting we can do a first read on that next time so thank you chris yep and you have okay it the other thing i wanted to say was that i will be um talking to aaron and um my team here in the planning department and the building commissioner, I haven't shown these things to them, but I want to get their input. So as, as this moves along, Aaron will be particularly um, useful in this um, monitoring and maintenance section. So I wanna get her input on that, but I will be tapping into the building commissioner and um, senior planner, Nate Malloy on the rest of the bylaw. So starting with um, page two of this document, um, sort of two thirds of the way down the page. Um, that's where abandonment or decommissioning starts. And this is a typical section uh, for from many of our bylaws that I've looked at. Um, <clears throat> so abandoning or decommissioning is important because you don't wanna be left with um, a, a big solar array and then kind of have it there and have it stop uh, producing power. And then the town has to deal with uh, taking it apart. So, um, and this is typical of what we've been doing so far. The Zoning Board of Appeals has been putting conditions on uh, solar arrays that have been installed to date to require um, 
decommissioning a decommissioning plan and then also to require that the uh, applicant put up a bond or or some type of um, financial security to make sure that the town is able to uh, take it apart if the uh, applicant is no longer able to do that. So anyway, starting off removal requirements, um, and I'll go through each paragraph and you can make comments on it and I'll write down what you what you say. Any large scale <clears throat> ground mounted solar voltaic installation or any substantial part thereof not used in the production of electricity for a period of one continuous year or more without written permission from the permit granting authority or is operating at less than 25% of its nameplate capacity or that has reached the end of its useful life or has been abandoned consistent with the abandonment section of this bylaw shall be considered discontinued and shall be removed. Does anyone have any comments on that one? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Janet, is that a new hand? I don't I Yeah, don't, it's a new yeah. hand. Um, I have a few questions. One of them is, I wondered um, about the one year. Is it and maybe Laura could help on this. Is it possible that somebody wouldn't operate a facility for more than one year, but somebody will come in and, you know, start it up a year and a half later? Um, and then the other question I had was in terms of the nameplate, like if it's operating at less than 25%, will they be, I don't know if this is in a different part of the camel, but will they be reporting, will the project be reporting to the town, like what it's actually producing versus its nameplate, like how would we know if they've dropped below 25%? Is that somewhere else in the reporting requirements or part of the bylaw? I think the answer to that is that they're required to um, produce a report, and this is elsewhere in the bylaw, but they need to produce a report for the town every year. And that would be reporting on things that have happened on site and how they've been operating. So I believe that would be covered there, but Laura may have more um, insight into that. Yeah, so just to be clear, like um, the amount of like equity that's been invested in a farm and the amount of tax equity that's been invested in a farm, um, we're going to be, you know, I don't wanna say the least concerned, but people are gonna be far more concerned than us if operations go below the 25% nameplate, nameplate capacity, because these are not you know, hundreds of dollars, these are millions of dollars, um, the total investment. So I think that's the first piece. And then no, I have never seen a farm um, you know, delay. I think your question was like, you know, pause operations for a year. Um, I've never seen basically, even in the case of bankruptcy of like PG&E, for example, um, the farms continued to operate. Um, electricity was continued to be produced and the farms continued to be maintained because the rule of solar is if you do not maintain the land where you're hosting the farm, if you're in violation of, you know, whatever the operating, um, you know, lease says, you'll be kicked off and, and nobody wants that. And in fact, it has never happened. Um, so, yeah. So I don't think that's a real concern. Yeah, go ahead, Jack. Yeah, I'm just a uh, nitpicky thing. I'm just wondering about the, the terminology of continuous, um, you know, one continuous year. I'm wondering if it, maybe there's something uh, that is uh, uh, not as definitive as, you know, it was operating 24 seven for 365 days, something less than that, you know, to account for the real world. Um, and I don't know what the word is, but maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> maybe Laura has a suggestion for that, but um, I understand. That's interesting because I think Jack brings up a good point. Let's say that a, you know, a storm comes through, a micro, you know, whatever tornado, and um, the farm needs to be rebuilt or parts of it need to be rebuilt. So it is offline for a temporary amount of time. We certainly don't want that to be an issue of abandonment um, or decommissioning. It's a matter of repairing and restoring. Um, so I think I see what you're talking about, um, Jack. Um, 
Yeah, maybe there's like 90%, you know, are operated, you know, continuously 90% of the year or something just to let some minor repairs take place and yeah. uh, some downtime for. Temporary well, cessation for repair. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. All right. I'll try to incorporate some language there. Okay. And and just to just I think the group probably knows that, but in every single ground lease, there is a section on abandonment and decommissioning. Um, so every lease defines abandonment differently. Um, but I think this is pretty consistent uh, for what you would see in every every lease. Okay. And while we um, continue on with a, a couple more paragraphs, Chris, but I apologize, okay. I have a hard, really hard stop at one. Okay. Um, and want to um, have the public at least um, a quick opportunity to uh, put in some comments. Do you want to give the public an opportunity to comment now, and then I can go back to this if there's time? Yeah, let's let's do that. Um, and then, um, but um, yeah, let's let's do that. Thank you. Um, uh, go ahead, uh, Stephanie. Do you? I, I see Steve's hand up, but you you, yep. you monitor. <laughs> Steve, you can go ahead. Hello, thank you. This is Steve Roof. I live in South Amherst. Um, speaking for myself here. A question about the decommissioning provision for of solar facilities in this bylaw. I'm curious if there the town zoning requires decommissions, decommissioning requirements for other sorts of development on lands, other kinds of development project houses, probably not buildings, not sure. So uh, are there other cases where decommissioning plans and a bond is required before a project is approved? Yes, it's true for um, wireless telecommunication, um, you know, those big stanchions that have all the antennae on them. Um, there's a section in the bylaw about that, and that does require decommissioning. And it also is um, incorporated into the zoning board or whatever board is reviewing one of those things. Um, the decommissioning is also a condition of that. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone else from the public who would like to make a comment or ask a question of the committee? Okay. I'm not seeing any hands. All right, I'll talk fast. Okay. Yeah, excellent. Eight yeah, minutes. Great. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> All right, the next paragraph is um, you want to bring it up, Steph? Upon written request from the building commissioner addressed to the contact address provided and maintained by the owner or operator as required above, the owner or operator shall provide evidence to the building commissioner demonstrating continued use of the installation. Failure to provide such evidence within 30 days of such written request shall be conclusive evidence that the installation has been discontinued. So in other words, if the building commissioner hears or observes that the installation is not uh, working anymore, then he would reach out to the um, contract contact address and seek uh, confirmation that it is either is has been stopped or isn't operating anymore or that it is indeed operating and that there's some kind of false information. So he sends a letter to um, that individual and then if he doesn't hear back from 30 in 30 days, then he uh, assumes that it has been discontinued. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the next one, the owner or operator or landowner shall physically remove the installation no more than 150 days after the date of discontinued operations. So that's almost half a year. Um, the owner or operator or landowner shall notify the town clerk, the PGA or permit granting authority and the building commissioner by certified mail of the proposed date of discontinued operations and plans for removal. Just a question there. Um, I don't know of a scenario where the landowner, unless they're also simultaneously the owner operator, would be responsible for physically removing a system. Okay. I will um, check on that. 
already. Um, next paragraph, removal shall consist of A, physical removal of all large-scale ground-mounted solar voltaic installation structures, equipment, security barriers, and transmission lines from the site. B, recycling of all possible materials and removal of all remaining solid and hazardous waste in accordance with the local, state, and federal waste disposal regulations. C, stabilization or revegetation of the site as necessary to minimize erosion and prevent impacts to wetlands or water bodies. The Permit Granting Authority, or PGA, may allow the owner or operator to leave landscaping or designated below grade foundations, provided they are filled in to minimize erosion and disruption to vegetation. This requirement may be waived if the landowner submits a plan for reuse of the site. D, any site that was deforested for the installation shall be restored to encourage native tree growth, including the planting of seedlings if necessary to establish growth. The cost of plant replacement shall be incorporated into the financial surety. So I just wanted to mention as an aside that for the Hickory Ridge um, solar installation, they need to move, remove a certain number of trees in order to um, establish their installation. And part of the um, <clears throat> special permit that was given to them requires that they replant the same number of trees that they remove. So um, do you have any comments on this paragraph? I, I would just have one comment on the, um, uh, on the um, requirement to uh, encourage uh, to, to in including the planting of seedlings if necessary. Um, there, there's a there's a science associated with restoring a forest, um, and uh, I'm just wondering whether there should be some requirement for some approval by uh, by uh, uh, the town forester, uh, town or state forester, with regard to the plan uh, that's being established to, to do, redo the the uh, the forest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can I just jump in that sometimes with the Conservation Commission, they actually specify a particular DBH or size of the of the um, mitigated planting. Yeah, and species are very important, too, in terms of what types of trees. Stephanie, what's a DBH? I'm sorry, diameter at breast height. It's just basically how you identify the circumference of the tree. Mm -hmm. Jack, yeah. Yeah, I'm just thinking of Hickory Ridge uh, and, you know, talk about, um, you know, reuse. Uh, maybe that that property certainly could be agricultural. Um, so, you know, what if the sign owner has other intentions um, for reuse of the land subsequent to the to the solar installation? That's a good question. And I guess maybe if, if you know, to, to the extent that a, a land was forested before, um, if the landowner wants to, you know, uh, at the end of the lifetime, um, farm farm the land instead of foresting the land, um, I'm not sure if we would want to not allow that to move forward. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm not, sure if it necessarily needs needs to uh, uh, require that it goes back to forest. Mm -hmm. um, let's um, let's put a bookmark here after uh, Jack and then Janet, because uh, I need to close out. Dan also has his hand raised um, okay. and hasn't spoken doing so. Yeah, OK, where's Dan then? Uh, He's back. Hey, yeah, I'm sorry. I was just, I was just saying there's this clause in there about um, this requirement may, may be waived if the landowner submits a plan for the reuse of the site. If you could just apply that to the entire oh, paragraph yeah. mm -hmm. instead of just yep. section C, that would maybe cover that issue. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. And I think uh, Janet will wrap us up. Um, I would just quickly, I, I, I'd love to come back and talk about this a little bit more. I was wondering about like agricultural soils, you know, in terms of keeping them on site or restoring them. And then, um, you know, um, so it, does that need to be 
considered separately and how does mitigation if you're cutting you know the forest i know built retirement requires you to sort of protect forests so is it would that tie into this section or is that in a different part so i think it's going to be a little complicated here may i answer part of that yeah please so I think for for uh, soils um, in general, uh, the soils are not removed um, for a solar installation in an agricultural site. Um, there's not really a need to do that because they're um, installed without using you know big foundations or anything. Um, there may be a need to re remove some soil to provide access roads and things like that. But generally speaking, um, the soils remain on a site that is um, an open field. So that's partly an answer to Janet's question. Great. Let's, um, and my apologies, I need to be at another meeting. Uh, so let's put a bookmark right here. Um, and we'll, why don't we plan to do, uh, continue the first reading of the remainder here, but then also circle back uh, to to uh, dig in a little bit from the, the this entire section is a second reading as well, uh, as well as any additional uh uh, text you may have for next time, uh, and we'll dedicate um, you know the bulk of the meeting uh, to uh, and uh, going on. I think into the into many meetings and uh, going forward to uh, to the bylaw itself. Um, so, thank you, everybody. Uh, I apologize for having to cut short. Bye, everyone. But, uh, Bye, but have everyone. a stay warm, um, and uh, we'll see you in two weeks at eleven thirty. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye, thank you. Good.